Sorry about that. Okay. Everybody needs to have a 1099A in front of them. At least one, if not more than one, because there's going to be a couple different uh, scenarios you're going to have to uh, sort of write down when you do this. Okay? And then you have to have uh, a 1041 form. Okay? That's a U.S. income tax return for estates and trust. Then you should have read that document that I had Tom post up, okay, from the IRS commissioner back in 85. I added a block to the bottom of it, and uh, we checked this out yesterday, that uh, uh, in the letter they were talking about using the 1040X until a new form was uh, made up and printed out. Well, the new form just happened to be the 1041 form. Before that, 1986, there was no 1041 form, just the 1040 form. And you have to come in and you have to have a foreign grant or trust EIN, and you have to have an estate EIN. Okay. That is the two categories they're holding out here. The name of their corporation that was set up in 1871 was the United States, and this was copyrighted out of England. It was the United States Fidelity and Guarantee Company. Now, the states have the same thing, a Fidelity and Guarantee Company. The churches, especially I know the Roman Catholic Church does, they have a fidelity and guarantee company. Most of the major uh, church organizations, and they're all 501C organizations, they all are set up with a uh, fidelity and a uh, guarantee as a guaranteed company, okay? The fidelity side basically is an insurance policy. It's a whole life basically for loss of life policy. And all of those whole life loss of life insurance policies are for 11 point two million dollars but they're a whole life and they're paid up they basically wrote bonds against that to fund that out of the collateral in our certificate of life of birth from our birthing estate that was recorded into the county records that certificate of life birth was a uh, a stopo over the assets to put a stop so that we could not properly utilize them. Okay, that was the confiscation of the gold that took place in 1933. Now, all the uh, amendments out here, except for maybe the 17th to where they allowed the senators to be voted in by the people, those states could not ratify them because they were taking rights away from the people. But if the states wanted to give up their rights and allow the people to vote the senators in, that was their prerogative because the senators were their protections in Congress to protect the rights of the state. In the Bill of Rights, there's two sets of rights that are called out. The state's rights and the people's rights. The people's rights are supposed to be protected by the congressman, where the state's rights were supposed to be protected by the senators. The right to women voting, 
That was an infringement upon the rights of man. So it's an invalid right, an invalid amendment. The states could never pass that. They can't give up the rights of a man in this country. That's why the original 13th Amendment had to come off the books. The states were the ones that ratified it. But they didn't have the authority to ratify giving up the people's rights. They could give up their rights, but they can't give up the people's rights. So every amendment since the 14th on has been an infringement on the rights of man. Now, man was supposed to have the estate. The woman was supposed to come into the man's estate. And if a woman was unmarried, she reverted under the protections of her father. That is biblical law that has been out there for eons. The first estoppel was basically when a man married a woman, the woman came into his estate, and he basically placed an estoppel against her going out and messing around with anybody else because he wasn't going to be liable for her going out and getting knocked up and bringing another person's deposit into his estate, making him pay for it. Now, if a woman wanted to go with somebody else, then she basically left this estate and went with the other. So she got divorced. She got her walking papers, and then she could pick up her dowry and go over there to the other area. If people don't like this, they see tough. That's the law. You better know the law. They could not give up the right of, to, to vote at 18. The child was supposed to be under the protections of the estate and of the father of that estate until they turn 21. By allowing an 18-year-old to vote, basically you're nullifying the parent's right to vote, the parent's power of vote. And that's what they've done with this democracy system. They have nullified the man's voting power. I just want to make that clarification that basically people don't understand the the Constitution, don't understand their rights or anything else. The 16th Amendment, basically for income taxes, was only ratified by two states. They couldn't ratify it. The only people that could ratify it were the individuals. And if you signed that 1040 form, filled one out, and signed it, you were essentially ratifying the 16th Amendment unknowingly. You can revoke that. And what that memo said and what the court case said was that basically you can go back in there and get all your taxes back because it was a fraudulent amendment. It was done in fraud, just like all the amendments since the 14th Amendment have been fraudulent infringements upon our rights in the Bill of Rights, either by the amendments or by turning around and allowing these fraudulent estoppels to be placed upon us. Unknowingly, you have life insurance policies placed upon you. 
your driver's license. It has a loss of life policy, a fidelity policy, for $11.2 million. That's why they can go out there and tell you to wear a seatbelt. Because they've got an estoppel trying to protect that policy, that insurance policy that they're carrying. So if you die, they don't have to pay it out. So they want to try and keep you from dying in that case. Now, there's others out there that basically try and get you killed so that they can cash it in because the people don't know that they've got these insurance policies. We knew that basically the military was placing somewhere in the neighborhood of a uh, $10 million insurance policy on every soldier. But yet, you were paying for a $30,000 life insurance policy to be given to your wife or whoever if you died in combat. Well, they would have been entitled to the other one to the fidelity policy also if they knew it was there. It was it was really eleven point two million dollars. All these loss of life policies are eleven point two million dollars. We've gone into the Fidelity website and every one of them came up eleven point two. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, and I'm pretty sure that some of the other 501c churches have done this also. They are also a fidelity and a guarantee company. So when you get baptized, you get a certificate. You're getting a whole or a loss of life certificate for $11.2 million dollars. So you can make it to the next step. And then in the Catholic Church, it's confirmation. Well, it's communion and then confirmation. But at confirmation, you now become a soldier of the church. So now you get a military life, loss of life policy placed upon you for another $11.2 million. And then if you get married in the church, you get another loss of life insurance policy placed upon you. That basically if one of them, and both in a marriage license, both parties have an $11.2 million life insurance policy on them. It's there in case one of the partners dies. The funds will be there to pick up the lost wages from the missing partner. I've talked about this before. I couldn't put my finger on it, how this was all being taken place. But it's all here. Now, if people don't want to believe this, don't believe it. Just turn this off and go your merry way because you'll never get out of this system unless you start listening and looking at this stuff. I beat it to the door and I beat it to the door. I've been every which way possible around this whole thing. And more of this information has come to light in the last couple of weeks then I don't know. We found in uh, Black's Law a court case where estoppel against estoppel is addressed in Black's Law. The court case was, I think, Stewart v. 
versus United States Fidelity and Warranty Company. Or Gar United States Fidelity and Guarantee Company. Okay? The fidelity side is where we need our foreign grant or trust. The guarantee side is where we need our estate EIN. And then we have to be an individual banker in the process to be the fiduciary over our two estate and trust bank accounts when we bring the assets out. Now, this is what they call heaven on earth scenario. You never see what goes on in heaven. Well, you never see really what goes on in the back room of these fidelity and uh, these guarantee bond writing and everything going on. But that's where you are supposed to pray to heaven to have your debts forgiven. These accounts were supposed to be there to pay the bills because they took our assets away from us with that certificate of live birth registration. The remedy probably has come about faster in the last uh, years, but people, we couldn't see it. I've had my estate EIN and my foreign grant or trust EIN since 2010, but I was missing the individual banker's EIN, the fiduciary. We have to be the fiduciary over those, over those two accounts. That was the missing link. And then we also have to go in and we have to do an estoppel by deed. Now, I sent in last week, okay, to where they got it Monday, and I just got it back from the clerk of the court yesterday, or not the clerk of the court, the county recorder's office. And it came back and said, uh, you need to put a cover sheet or essentially a title sheet, title page, upon the instrument you're wanting to put into the records. They sent me the write-up for the state codes of what needs to be entered in there. And it makes all the sense because every book has to have a title page. You have to know who is submitting this and for what purpose it's being submitted into the process. A sort of a synopsis, mini synopsis, an outline of what's going on in that attachment. Think back to your grade school days of English 101. So, but we're going to do not, and see, I sent it in as the confirmation by, by written memorandum. I'm going to turn around and I'm going to be putting in the new uh, uh, estoppel by deed to where I basically shut down any outside fraudulent estoppels against that birthing recording in the county records. Then they can no longer use that collateral any longer. But in the meantime, and I've got other stuff up to the Attorney General's office, I haven't heard anything out of them. 
I haven't heard anything out of Secretary of State's office. Well, they're not going to, okay? They are basically shitheads from the word go. They're working for this other uh, corporation, this other company. And they're under a code of silence in the damn process. But now that we've got and we've opened up more loopholes and found the loopholes in the process, now we can push that door further and further open. And we've got it wide open now. Because it's what we're going to be coming in. We're going to be putting in 1099As. So, you have two sides to this company that we're going to go after. Okay? The United States, I'm going to give that example. The United States one. You have the guarantee policy and you have the fidelity policy. You have a fidelity policy under the SS number. And that is basically a uh, loss of life, whole life policy that you can cash out. And that goes into your trust. So you have to fill out the 1099A with, like, in my case, Patrick Devine Foreign Granter Trust. Address and everything come down, the lenders, and that I'm the lender. The trust was the lender. Then the lender's identification number, which is going to be, in my case, I've got a 98 series number. Whatever EIN number you've got for your foreign grant or trust, put it in there. Okay? And put the dash in. Now, the borrower's identification number is going to be the social security number without any dashes. And then... Down below, it's going to be the account number down there is going to be the certificate of live birth registration number without any dashes. Now, the borrower's name is the United States All Capital Fidelity and Guarantee Company. As care of the United States F and G Company Treasurer. I shortened down fidelity and guarantee down to just F and G. Treasurer. Okay? So this goes to the Treasury Department at fifteen hundred Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest. Washington, D.C., and then you've got to have the right zip code. Then you come over the date the lender acquisition or knowledge of abandonment. We're going to do an acquisition of that whole life insurance policy. I don't know if any of you have ever gone out there and ever gotten a whole life insurance policy, but it's yours. You can cash it out any time you want. Especially when you were the grantor of that policy. And that's why you have a foreign grantor trust coming in because you were really the grantor of those assets in that fidelity policy that was being held in trust. And you're going to do a total liquidation of that policy. 
The balance of the principal outstanding is $11.2 million. The fair market value of the property is $11.2 million. Is the borrower uh, personally liable for the repayment of a debt? Yes. Now you just completed $11.2 million, 1099A. Altogether, I've got something like seven of these items out here. I'm going to be submitting six of them, and I don't have the address for the uh, New York State Treasurer's Office, so I can't do that one. But I can do that one next week when I get the address and just do an amended 1041 form. Now, to do one for the Foreign Grantor Trust, we take this 1099A, we send it out, the B copy to the borrower, to the treasurer there at Pennsylvania Avenue. You could fax it into them, too, if you want to. Doesn't make any difference how you get that into their hands, okay? The big one is the red copy. You need to have the... Order some 1099A so you have the red copies and send those in to the appropriate IRS office. And then you send, uh, you put down the value on your 1041 form when you're going in uh, after the account in the process. Your fiscal year, I put down December 25th, 2014. Basically, that was the birth date. So, and see, that's when the sun goes down and then basically dies for three days. And basically comes back up on December 25th the start of the new time frame. And then basically the ending of my year is December or the 25th of December, 2015. So we can use the 2014 1041 forms. The one for mine is Patrick Devine, Foreign Grantor Trust. My EIN number, name and title of fiduciary. Patrick Devine, Private Bank, ENT, Estate and Trust. Date entity created. This is the estate or the trust entity is the date that needs to be placed there not the fiduciary. So whatever date you've got that EIN for your foreign grant or trust or your estate EIN, that is the date that goes in block D. Shouldn't mark anything in uh, E. Then you come down, you put the address and everything in. You come down and you mark in block F. And this will probably be your initial return. You can always do more 1041s. You can do one every day if you want to do one. But just don't forget to do your 1099A to go along with it. And then at the end of the year, you do a final one to close it down. On this form, everything is essentially zero. All the way down to line 25. 
or 24, 24E. You mark 24E. It says, is, is, if any is from 10, forms 1099, check here. Put a check mark there. It says, I've got six fidelity life insurance policies, whole life insurance policy. It came up to $67.2 million. So that's what I put in there. 24F, zero. 25, same as in 24E. 26 and 7, zero. 28 and 9, same as what's in 24E. Essentially done. Now you come down to sign here. I would handwrite in without recourse in there. Sign your name for your individual banker. EIN of the fiduciary if a financial institution. Yes, you are a private bank. So you put down your individual banker's EIN number there. And then you date it. And then send it in. Everything on page two is either NA or zero. Think about what you're doing there. We owe no taxes. We're after the return, and that only comes in in line 24E. The federal income tax withheld, and everything out here is a tax. Even that insurance policy is basically a tax. It's taxed us. And it's being withheld from us. So we have to come in and get it back. Now the estate is going to be essentially the same way. You need to do 1099 A's against the guarantee side of this company. They've been writing bonds and everything else against our assets. So that they can fund their drugs movements and whatever else they're doing out there illegally. Building a bridge here or there. They got to get the funds. So basically they're writing bonds to fund those items. And like your voter registration card, basically you are giving them authorization to go against your assets and have the collateral be the backing for their bills that they were writing. So that they could write the bonds to turn around and pay for it. Nobody's taxes are out here supporting anybody else except for the corporation. You're not funding any of those illegal Mexicans coming across the border or any other illegal coming into this country. Your tax dollars are not going to them. They may be writing bonds against your assets. The company does and basically then gives things over there until basically they can hoodwink those Mexicans into signing up with a Social Security card and then basically placing their assets under the control of the government. Or the religious entities out here. 
The churches are the biggest culprits in this whole damn process. They have been the ones that have killed more people in in any action out here. The whole setup about the Vietnam War was that Cardinal Spellman wanted more American soldier deaths after they got another insurance policy on them so that they could collect the insurance. They didn't care how many people over there in Vietnam died as long as there was a good mortality rate on the American side. That's how evil and sinister these people are. Excuse me, Patrick. Yes. Uh, they got two forms in the income tax return. One is for state and trust, and the other one's for income tax return for state trust and schedule A, B, G, K, and K1. Uh, which one of the, that schedule should we get? You don't get any okay. of the schedules. Okay, just so 1041. Just the 1041. Everything else is zero. You can go look at those forms, and you're going to see that they don't apply. Okay. Yeah, don't take my word for it. Go and check out all the forms. They don't apply. Yes, but they don't. check them I out for yourself, okay? No, I, you said to go look for it. I just they, they had two of them, so I just needed I needed to check which one. And I see that, There's that a lot don't. more. There's a lot more other ones on there, too, okay, when you go on both pages, okay? You're going to check them all out, and they don't apply. See, that's what people don't understand. They don't know how to read, and then they think they that applies to them, and it don't. Because you're not owing any taxes. You're only there for one purpose, and one purpose only, to get your taxes back. Okay. Okay? Yes, sir. Okay. And we're coming in to do an acquisition or to come and claim the abandonment of those policies. Now, if Ma or Pa died within the last 10 years, you could probably go after their fidelity insurance policy of $11.2 million. Under the death certificate, you could go after their guarantee assets. Even if it's over 10 years old. Because they, the other party is holding them in fraud. In a lot of cases, you just take a guess. Now, on the fidelity side, you're doing a total liquidation. Okay, what did Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz do? It was a life insurance policy. She was essentially living in the dead world. She had to come back to reality. So, essentially, she liquidated her fidelity policy and came back to life. She was under age, so she did not have a guarantee account yet. See, the guarantee basically essentially came in primarily under when you sign up with the Social Security. Even though you were accruing assets into your uh, Certificate of Live Birth account from the dividends that were being paid in. That was not under the guarantee side of the contract.
So you've got three sources of funds coming in here. You've got the fidelity, you've got the guarantee, and then you've got the automatic dividends that are going in against your birthing account. that's being held under that damn uh, certificate of live birth, a stopple registration. I hope I'm making sense to you people out here. It's really clear, Patrick. Now, an example of uh, the guarantee side is basically that certificate of title and most all your guarantees are under a certificate. Okay, like the certificate of title to your vehicle. That certificate has a value on it. You can turn around and do a 1099A now against that certificate, and that certificate is normally under a nine-digit number. So that is the borrower's identification number for that certificate. I've got, and see, it, it was pretty obvious that that was taking place when they converted my certificate of title over into a junking certificate. That value was put over on the junking certificate, too. So that value is sitting there, okay? It's a guarantee. We have to come in and claim it. And since I've got a salvage title, it's basically coming in, I'm doing, it's been abandoned. Abandonment of secured property. You don't have to circle which one you're doing, abandonment or uh, acquisition. It makes no difference. You're coming in to claim it. This is your claim check. It's your taxing claim. So basically I put one in for the state of Iowa. Iowa Fidelity and Guarantee Company care of the Iowa F&G Company Treasurer. That state treasurer is wearing two hats. And the value of that certificate that is outstanding and that the market value of that property is $20,900. And the borrower is liable to pay that back. That's how we start decreasing the national debt. We start putting the funds back in our pocket to where they belong. And if you get in there and close down all your fidelity life policies, why would they try and kill you then? Because they're not going to make a profit off you. You're of no use to them any longer. So don't be scared of this. But if you stay scared, yeah, they can take you out any time they want to. Just look at what happened in Germany. When they started running short of funds, okay, they had the people under these fidelity and guarantee contracts under VSS system, under the Gestapo system that was perpetrated by the Church of Rome to fund Hitler in the process. Well, when things started going against them, they no longer had the means to pay the debts that were out there. So what'd they do? 
instead of paying the debts to the people, they started killing the people so they didn't have to pay the debts. Because the debts were really owed to the people, just like in this country. The national debt is owed to the people. The national debt is the debt that this United States Fidelity and Guarantee companies owe to us. But if you don't take the life insurance policies away from them, they will definitely take you out so they can collect those life insurance policies. So that they don't have to pay it out. That's your choice right now. So I gave you an example of how to do a uh, Fidelity 1099A and also one for the uh, guarantee side of the aisle with the certificate of title. You can go in and guess your Social Security account, SS account, under the guarantee usage of it. And put in like against the driver's license. The driver's license is normally a nine digit number. On the borrower's side, it just says borrower's identification number. It doesn't say EIN. But it would be essentially a routing number from that account. And see, you have a fidelity under the driver's license number, and you also have a guarantee under the driver's license number. Because they've been using that asset, and they've also been using you as collateral in the process, too. So they could put like $5 million in against the driver's license under the guarantee side. A couple hundred million against the Social Security guarantee side. And you're only doing a partial when you go against the guarantee. You don't know how much is there. So don't say total liquidation and put down a number because you don't know what that number is. But put something down reasonable under a billion dollars when you do the Social Security. I put it in just for $500 million. I did one with the Church of Rome the same way for $500 million, or with the Roman Catholic Church. Figure since I'm 65 years old and they've been using my shit for all this time, it's probably worth something like that. In their fraudulent monetary system, especially when you divide that value by 17 and then that converts down to real silver dollars. Yeah, that's probably reasonable. But we're only doing a partial liquidation on the guarantee side. I, I reiterate this again. On the fidelity side, you do a total liquidation. On the guarantee side, you do a partial liquidation. You're going to read the definition in Ballantyne's about partial liquidation. Go to the dictionaries. Check out these words. It's about time they start paying their bills. And then basically, I'm on the ones for my 
uh, trust for the $67.2 million for this six uh, uh, loss of life policy, fidelity policies that I have, I'm going to have those directly deposited or try and have them directly deposited into my direct express card. If you have a treasury direct card, you could have it deposited there. Blow their mind. Now, when you do a direct deposit, there's a form called the 8302 form. And when you're going to use that, you need to make sure you've got it in for more than a million dollars. And I wouldn't even do a 1041 unless I had a accumulation of a million dollars on the thing. Why waste your time with under a million dollars? Always add something more to get it over a million dollars. Do an extra 1099A against the guarantee side. Take another partial withdrawal. They'll tell you when there's no more there. If they don't come out and terminate you and get you completely out of the system. Now, for the estate that I've got, I've got a grand total right now of one billion three hundred and fifty five million twenty thousand and nine hundred dollars. That's what's going in on my one for my estate. And I'm not going to put a direct deposit in for that. They can bring that to me and go back bearer bonds, two of them, or whatever. Because a big gold back merit bond is supposed to be uh, roughly uh, $500 million. It's the max that uh, one of those would be. So we'll see what happens. If nothing, it should be at least one. If they do the conversion of 17 Federal Reserve dollars to one silver dollar. Then it should collect about 600 million silver dollars, or uh, roughly uh, 600 million in uh, gold dollars, dollars worth of gold. We're there. Whether you want to believe it or not. But you need to have your uh, 1099As. You need to have your uh, 1096 forms. When you send the red copies in, you need to send them in with a 1096 form. And then you need to, you can get the 1041 form off the IRS website. You can get the 8302 form off the website. And you can fill those in on your computer and print them out then. You can't fill out the 1040 form online. You need to get that four-part 1040. Or you can make a template up to do the Part B of that 10 or the 1099A form and send that out. But to send a red copy out, you're going to have to handwrite it. I did have templates up to do that before, but I'm not going to mess with that. Handwrite it out, okay? You haven't got that many to do. And basically, if you're going to get uh, 100, 100 million back, <laughs> you ought to be able to do a little work to get that much money back. If you can't do that, then basically you ain't worth giving it to to begin with. Because you're lazy and you're going to stay lazy.
Now, anybody got any questions on this? Yes, Patrick. Um, this is uh, Guillermo, California. Uh, you went over the 1099A. Uh, we didn't go all the way to the description of the property. Do what? For a uh, mortgage? No, no, no. Description of property on the 1099A, box number six. Let me check. Let me pull it up here. Yeah, description of property, partial liquidation of okay. my uh, SS guarantee policy for the usage of my certificate of live birth vessel assets withheld as collateral funds, collateral assurance funds. Okay. Sort of like what I've been talking about in that uh, a state or at uh, – a stopple by deed document. All righty. Um, and yeah. if you're doing a and if you're doing a fidelity side, uh, it would be the total liquidation then. The total that liquidation the of that yeah. loss of life policy. Yeah, that would be the only difference between description yeah. of property between the fidelity side and the guarantee side. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank one you. is for a total liquidation, the other is for a partial liquidation, and one's against the guarantee, the other's against the fidelity, and then it's either against the as usage of the assets, the estate assets, and then the taxes that are being withheld are being held as collateral assurance funds. And see, that's where the state CAFRs come in, collateral assurance fund reserve. Right. That's what CAFR stands for, not Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. That's a fraud. Yeah, that's what they put out in the public to uh, to deceive. They also put it out in the private, too. Ah, okay. They're just born liars. Okay, that's the only way they can operate, is to lie. Okay, any other questions? No, really, Patrick. But thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to get to doing this as soon as I can. If nobody wants to do it, nobody's got to... Hey, there's always well somebody willing to do the, the steps out here. Yeah. So let's see what happens. I'll try to put this into motion, Patrick. Thank you. Okay. Just make sure you get your EINs. You need to have your foreign grant or trust EIN, your estate EIN, and your individual banker's EIN. You've got to have okay. three to make this thing work. Right now, I still got to do the foreign grant or CIN. Um, Tom's going to work on that with you, okay? All right, we're going to do yes, that sir. together. Okay. Okay, and uh, yeah, I'm ready to proceed forward, sir. Okay. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. Yep. I'm in a bad situation, and um, hey, maybe if they were in my shoes, they'd also want to get this done. Okay. Anybody Patrick, else have any comments? Patrick, on the 1041, um, it says in the left-hand box, track, you're supposed to put your name of the state and trust. Uh, it has a box of eight or ten different boxes. Do we check the decedent's estate, or which box do we check? If you're doing the estate, yes, decedent's estate. See, I called up the IRS, okay, uh, back, and I kept getting tired of getting all these damn things from Atlanta, Georgia. So I called them up, and I said, you know, that uh, you keep printing that out as all capital name person. I said, that is a tombstone name, okay? That's a dead man's name. And so basically I was talking to one of the girls, and she passed me up to her supervisor, and I reiterated the same thing to her. 
very nice. I didn't get blown out of control or anything. So basically, she passed me up to uh, the guy, the department head. Well, now I know that that department head knew what was on that form that I had Tom post there that the IRS commissioner sent down to those IRS offices. So when I was explaining to him that this was a dead man's account and everything, he knew damn well that I needed to get an estate EIN, that that fictional person was dead, and I needed an EIN. So basically he said he'd take care of it. Two weeks later, in the mail, I got a a state EIN. And see, he was complying with my complaint, just like that IRS commissioner said in the letter. We're here to help and serve. You just have to call on upon us in the right way. So you go in there and argue that you owe no taxes and that you're a sovereign and all that happy garbage because you're not a sovereign. You are the sovereignty of the sovereign. I'm not here. I'm here. Oh, you're late. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. Okay, you're going to have to listen to the call offline. Yeah, okay. But see, yes, that's the decedent's estate. Now, when you do the trust, you mark grantor type trust. Because it's a foreign grantor trust, and you're the grantor. You gave the funds to those insurance policies to write the life insurance policy. So you, I mean, it's just like you going out here and getting a whole life insurance policy with the company, with some private company. You have to put the funds in. So you're the grantor of the funds to that whole life insurance policy. That's why we're we're coming in under the fidelity loss of life policies with the trust. Okay? People understand that? Yeah. Yeah. And then the name and title of the fiduciary is basically, the name is the Patrick Divine Private Bank and Trust. And then you have an individual banker in in your private bank. And his EIN goes down on the signature line space down there. So we're filling out um, two different types of 1041s for... In, one in for the trust and one for the estate. Okay. With our 1099A... Yes, the appropriate 1099-As go with the appropriate 1041 form. You do a 1099-A against either the fidelity or the guarantee side of that company. Okay? Okay. Listen to the audio again, okay? Take notes. And then listen to it again. And then check your notes. And then listen to it again. Ed, I want to and then listen something. to it again. I want to Maybe about something. after five or six times, you'll get the point. Ed, I want to ask you something. Okay. All right. Uh, does fractional banking uh, be involved with this? Does what? Fractional banking. No. Be involved with it. No. You don't worry about that. That's not your concern. That's what well, they the reason, do. Well, what the reason I'm saying that is because 
uh, like if it's down, just throwing a figure out there, just saying if it's $100,000, then then we need to do 10 times that, that figure. That's what I'm saying. No, you don't worry about that, okay? You put down a value. You're only do, doing a partial withdrawal, okay. a partial liquidation. Okay. So you put down a value. Okay. $500 million. You don't play around with this fractional banking stuff. That's for them. Okay. Okay. Okay? All right. All right. That's, that's, that's the only question I was wondering about. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I like to pick on Bill, okay? So people don't get upset when I pick on Bill. <laughs> Bill's used to it. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, yep. We do we mark initial return for each one or just on the first one we do? You what? Uh, the initial return. Do we mark the initial return for the first one or every one? For the first one. After that, you do the amended. Okay, got it. And then at the end of the year, for your last one, you do a final. Okay. Uh, and this will probably bring out, if you put down that much money, this will bring out some men in black to see you, I guarantee. Especially in my case, going after the church. I'm sure that the damn Jesuits will be out here. <laughs> the real men in black. I'll tell them thank you for educating me. Huh? I'll tell them thank you for educating me. I went to Jesuit school. Any other questions? Yes, this is Burdell. I have a question. Patrick, one, mine didn't pay out. I did this in May 15th with the uh, certificate of live birth on the 1099A, and I received a bill for $92,500. I got the bank. What? I received a bill, a bill for $92,500. From Internal Revenue Service for the state. I did a 1099A on May 7, 2015. The light bill got paid for the whole year, but the live birth certificate didn't get paid. I mean, refunded. I was just trying something. You didn't go in and claim it with a 1041 form. Yes, I did. I did a 1041, a 1096, and a 1098. Okay. Did you have all your EINs? Did you have your individual banker's EIN? Yes, sir. I had the 47, the 98 EIN number, and the 32 EIN number. Okay. So you put down that you had a private bank, like in my case, Patrick Divine Private Bank ENT as the fiduciary. What fiduciary did you put in there? The all caps name. The all caps name goes up in the estate or in the trust too. No, now, did I you put it? Bank. Did you put it? The fiduciary has to be the bank. Okay, and see you when you got your individual banker's EIN. You had to name the company that that individual banker was working for. Okay. What company did you say that banker was working for? I didn't specify. See, that's what you needed to do. You need, probably need to go in and correct that uh, for your individual banker and correct the company that he's working for. Okay. okay, because see, that's, this estate and this trust are two banking accounts in our bank, in our private bank. Okay. 
See, that's what I was missing. We had the accounts. We tried to do these, but we didn't have the bank protecting those accounts. And that's what a fiduciary does is to protect the items. He's like a trustee. But it's a private trustee. We don't trust anybody else with our shit. Okay. Okay, so well, it's I, not really a trust in that regards. So I don't have to um do the ninety two thousand five hundred dollars? You what? I don't have to pay that ninety two thousand five hundred dollars? That was a bill, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Well, basically, is what you should have done, okay? And basically, I put up about a week or so ago, I put up the endorsement. And see, that was a bill against the guarantee side of the account. You're the guarantee, EE. The account is the guarantee with a Y on the end of it. And then your fictional person is the guarantor. But now it becomes an obligation of the entity that is holding the guarantee with a Y on it and also your guarantor, and that reverts back to the United States Fidelity and Guarantee Company treasurer. Okay. So you needed to do an endorsement and send it back into the company treasurer. Not to the United States Treasurer, but the company treasurer. The okay. F and G company treasurer. Excuse me, does you still have an email, Patrick? Huh? Do you still have an email? No. Okay. I'm not on internet. Okay. Well, at least the light bill got paid for the year. Yeah, but you can do the endorsement, send that in, okay? It's a bill, okay? Yeah. yeah. What's a dollar bill? It's a bill. Yeah. You have to come in and claim it or deposit it. Okay. But you get this other done, and you turn around and put it in, and basically... Then uh that yeah, you needed to claim that. If they sent you the bill, basically you're trying to give you money. That you we owe no money, okay? Okay. That's the misnomer. Everybody thinks that when they get that bill, we owe it. No, that's on the other side of the looking glass. When it comes to our side, that's cash. You just have to endorse it and send it back to the one who is the obligor to make the payment or to cash to settle off the books. And so go in and get those endorsements that I had Tom post here about two weeks ago. Okay. We need to do the 1099s to act, do the acquisition to get the funds out of the account. We can't do them just strictly by an endorsement. But to pay a hospital bill or anything like that, you do the endorsement and send it to the obligor to make the payment. In your guarantor's name. Because you're the guarantee, the double E. Any other questions? Patrick. Hello? 
Go ahead. Speak up. I, I just wanted to share something about widely held uh, investment trusts as the reporting requirements are concerned for for the uh, the IRS. It says here that trustees and middlemen of these don't file a Form 1041. They just do the 1099. So one of the angles that I've, I've uh, formulated for myself using the information that I just wanted to thank you for for sharing because it's been uh, very instructive and informative for me. I've had a couple things happen that I've been, uh, I consider success that are directly related to things that uh, you have shared, and I just want to thank you for that. And, and sharing back, I found that when you're taking the position of being a foreign grantor to what I consider a living trust on, on the Republic steroids, you know, what you're, what you're telling everybody about the EINs is very important because you've got to make a distinguishing characteristic between what you've absorbed the Social Security Trust into a state, and then when you've created a new vehicle and trust uh, and indicated that you have a trustee, and then you clearly delineate them with separate tax identification numbers, uh, you're, you're on a really solid platform. And what I just wanted to share in there was about when, you, when you're filing these returns, they're very specific about um, the type of uh, entities that file 1041s are considered domestic. So if people are making a lot of money in the U.S., uh, if it's traceable to U.S. sources, like if you're in employment and you're, and you're depositing a lot of stuff and you want to maintain some sort of domestic affiliation, and, and but if you're going to come completely from the outside and do the grantor, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that possibly if all that may be required is the 1099-A and the 1099-6 to accompany it. And that's considered the return when you have no other obligation as a domestic entity. And that's all I really wanted to share and I wanted to thank But the whole deal about the EINs, okay, the setting up of that EIN for the foreign grantor trust and for the estate, it was you were setting up a bank account in your private bank. Now, if you have a bank account in your private bank, you have to have a routing number to route the funds into that account. Okay? That's what the EIN number is. It's a bank routing number. You're routing it out from the nine digit on the other side of the ledger over to your private bank in your estate or in your trust. Wow. So you can use that as the routing number, and then the 11-digit account number is obviously the number that well, we Well, it doesn't make any difference what that account number, that certificate of live birth number is. Some states right. operate with seven digits. Uh, okay. Okay? So don't get hung up on the numbers. you got to know what the numbers are doing. And see, that's what people don't understand half this stuff that they're out there perpetrating to know what they're actually dealing with. And then they spread false rumors, and basically I've been down half these false rumor mill items trying to prove them wrong. Or trying to prove them right and finding out that they're dead wrong. I guess that's the way you look at it. Well, you're right on the money, sir, and I just wanted to take the chance to thank you. Yeah, just by some of the actions that I've had recently, and basically little feedbacks here and there, okay? You go about this in the right way, you're going to get the right feedback, like even from that county recorder, okay? She didn't deny that we couldn't put those into that birthing record, but she, we had to go about it in the right way. So I'll go back and I'll put it in the right way. I'll put my estoppel by deed in. I'll put a cover sheet with it. And basically it's cost $12 to put the filing in. And that's your perfection of interest on the private side for that, for that security, right? Yeah. Basically then we're solely closing it down. And now it's all in the private. They can't use it any longer. And now all the funds have to come back to us because we're the owner of it. They get real uptight where in the jurisdiction in question for me in terms of the uh, the form of the of your submission, so that the county attorney is like right in the middle of it. 
all the county attorneys, yeah, they're basically, they're a bar attorney. And see, that's what an estoppel is. It's a bar. It's a barrier. And see, they come in with their faults or their fraudulent estoppels out here. Their SS estoppels and everything, trying to prevent us from coming in and knowing anything. But now when we do, and we know that the name belongs to us, and we put our higher claim in, in our third dimension, we operate in three dimensions. They only operate in two dimensions. So three dimensions is higher than two. We overrule them every time. And then if they harm us, they're the ones that are going to go to jail, and they're going to go to jail big time. And these judges, some of these judges do know that. That's why they will back off in a heartbeat. You speak with authority. You don't weasel around. You don't cow down to them. You just speak with authority, and you will get authoritative respect. You don't argue anything. You speak with authority. I had one little eye doctor. He's a midget. Or, no, he's not a midget. He's a dwarf. Okay, there's a difference between midgets and dwarfs and everything. But he's a dwarf. So he's a mid-range person. But the guy spoke with authority. I admired that. I respect somebody that comes into there when they do that because they give me confidence that they know what the shit they're talking about. People that come in wishy-washy, I get so bent out of shape at them because they're weaseling around. They're almost whining. And that's what they expect from us, too. So if you come in and you speak with authority, you will back them down. Because they're scared of authority. Because 90% of the time, the authority is the one who's speaking the truth. And they hate the truth. Does that make sense to any of you guys out there? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, it does. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Hey, Patrick. Yeah. Um, This is Corey. I talked to you a couple Sundays ago about the court case. Yeah. And uh, I I do know that you're telling the truth because when I shut down everything, the... uh, the ID and everything else that contains with that, they're still trying to process it, but they can't process it any longer because it's shut down. Because I established the authority when they thought that they had the power of authority. You understand? Yeah. Now, the one thing you have to do, okay, and you have to exonerate that judge uh, in the process. I did, but then the judge said that I didn't have any basis for the motion to stay. He didn't. He didn't accept it. I exonerated him. But okay, did you somebody, do a uh, did you do an estoppel by deed? No, I did not. Okay, that's what you need to do. You need to do your estoppel by deed. You need to claim that entity, that you are the living entity and that you're the owner of that and that you will basically pardon them or give them absolution in the process Yeah. if they drop if they drop all this charges otherwise you will proceed against them with the IRS okay because somebody entered in a motion to release him um from uh, custody on the 10th, and then I gave him the exoneration letter on the 12th, 
And then the judge came back with that. Put a 1099A in against him. Okay? Against against the judge? No, or? against your person. Bring him out. You're claiming him. You're doing an acquisition of him. Right. Bring him out. Okay? He's being held there fraudulently. Right. Lay a claim to all the funds that they're basically putting out there against that court case. Right. Because... It shows in process at the prison, right? But they it says not verify. They can't verify it because they can't get the funds. Yeah, so and basically you, if you right. put that estoppel by deed in and you get that in there and basically you put that in against the court that you're claiming that court case. See, you right. come in with a estoppel by deed and you claim that court case. You now own that court. Right, because I can't. Whose name? Whose name? Whose name is the court case in? It's in my brother's name. That's right. But, you claim that title. That is the title of the court case. So you claim the title. Now you own that court case. That, by doing exactly an estoppel by deed. Right. And I issued that estoppel by deed to the court or issued to the county recorders? You put it into the court. That you're coming in and you're doing that and you get that recorded into the court action. That you are the owner. You're the, uh, but you're claiming that under as your estoppel by deed or you're in your brother's name if you have power of attorney for him. I do. Okay. Then you do it and put it down in writing, and that this is a written, by your written uh, authority, okay, like the templates I posted up there. You have your written, and you have your markings, and you have your seal. And see, now you have three points. You're operating in the third dimension, where they are only operating in the second dimension, okay, with a false title, but you've just taken that title away from them. Right. I got one more question. And the judge, when he entered in his sins report, he put his his fingerprint on the sins report on the left side. What does that mean? I, I came in and I put my fingerprint on the right side with my signature. He put his on the left side. Well, see, he's a debtor. He is operating for the debting side of the issue. Right. So he's showing you right there that he's the debtor, or he's operating on the debtor side of the issue. Right. But all you have to do is claim that title of that court case. You have to claim that case. Under your estoppel by deed. Right, because I entered in the the, the land pole deed. Now I need, need to enter in the estoppel by deed. Yeah. Yeah, don't try and go any of the other routes or anything like that. Just keep it simple. Okay, read what it says about the estoppel by deed in, Bla- in Valentine's Dictionary. Then you can go through and... Uh, uh, read it doesn't break it out quite as well in black's dictionary but uh it does have a lot of information about estoppels in blacks okay, and see you come in and then you bar the public defender in the process you have just barred him out of your court because you have the higher estoppel See, they're trying to operate with their false estoppel against you, barring you from telling the truth. But if you come in with a with a estoppel by deed, you just took their estoppel and you crunched it. You annihilated it. So now it's an estoppel against estoppel. And you have the higher estoppel to kill their estoppel. 
Right. Yeah, and Black's, in Black's it. Dictionary, and see, that's the one to where the court case references Stewart versus United States Fidelity and Guarantee Company. And see, that's what this court is all operating under, is the Fidelity and Guarantee Company. They're just the judicial, they're just the administrators of that uh, Fidelity and Guarantee Company. They're, they're insurance adjusters. And they will lie like hell to try and get you to say, hey, you didn't board up your windows. Well, it wasn't in the damn contract that I had to have my damn windows boarded up when the hurricane hit. So you're going to pay for all that broken glass. But if you don't speak with authority and come in the right way against these guys, those insurance adjusters, like those court judges are, they will run right over you like they have been doing in the past. They're doing a good job, okay? I can see that you're doing a lot of this with authority. Now you right. just need to add a couple more things to it, and you've got them. You've got them. Right. Okay. Because it's like it's like it's frozen, and they're just waiting on something, something for me. And I understand what you're saying. Yeah. They're hoping you're going to go in the wrong direction. Prove them wrong and go in the right direction. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Have a good day. Anybody else? Okay, Tom, call tonight. Okay, thank you, Patrick. We'll see you Sunday night, then. Very okay, good. thank you, Patrick. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. 